Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? Hello and welcome to Riff Worship, the show where <laughs> Austin Paulson, Dylan Adams, and I, Justin Swindle, uh, talk about what makes a riff, our favorite riffs, and our favorite albums and songs containing the riff. Uh, Austin, Dylan, how are y'all doing today? Great. What do you, how do you think you did? A plus. A, That's the best a, intro the show's done so far. You know, I, I was going to say that. Um, <laughs> you know, that that might be the best. That might be the one we just use from here on out. We just use as a sound bite, and and, and wow. that's the one. Like that's you know that's canned. Neo. That's the one. Every every intro from this episode forward is canned. We fake <laughs> all of them. Yep. <laughs> one take. That's all it took. I don't. Who's the? I'm sure there's like an actor out there. Who's just like I don't do. I don't do multiple takes. And so that Justin was a Bruce Riddle. Willis thing for years, wasn't it? Oh, sure. I'm sure. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, how are yeah. y'all? How are the how are the holiday? Uh, how, how are the holiday? Oh man, I'm <laughs> I'm still stuffed to the gills with stuffing and turkey and the things that we have definitely consumed because we are obviously in the future now or present as I would like to call it. We've we're definitely recording this after Thanksgiving. That's the thing we're doing right now. The the bird was murdered. The ham was cooked. Uh, I ate none of it. Uh, so I'm doing pretty good. My family gathering was so awkward. We got into fight about politic. <laughs> a, a politic. Fight. A, po- a politic. <laughs> oh, man. That's an uh, aqueduct pipe. I love lighting the Thanksgiving candles. And <laughs> man, you are. Here we go. <laughs> ah, cha, cha, cha. This yeah. is Riff Worship. Ah, cha, 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 this cha. is a podcast where I talk about stuff. Um, do you guys like? Do you guys f- with Thanksgiving food that much? I don't know. That one time, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Dylan, that, that one day. Much, I don't know how much of it you can really eat at this point, but um, any of the vegetable dishes, like you know, as long as it doesn't have like bacon or something in it, and my my family's pretty good about like, all right, you know. Like we're not going to put bacon like the green beans and stuff like that. So yeah, what usually about your, how it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say usually how it gets handled is like my brother will do like the meats, and then you know uh, Lauren and I the last couple of years have put together all like the vegetable dishes and everything. That's fair. I'm going to get. I was going to say because like you know some gravy, just like hey, let's throw that fucking turkey carcass yeah. in here, like throw yeah. that whole <laughs> neck in there, and just that's where the flavor is. So to balance it out, I always make mac and cheese, and I make like you know obviously non-dairy mac and cheese and like i haven't told anybody what's in it and they're like oh this is pretty good I was like isn't it isn't it that sounds <laughs> like it's, it's it's great isn't it um but it's it, it's usually that and i i will i will say this i will partake in deviled eggs just because i fucking love them and i love smell like a dead body for the next few days after it. we know that about you yes that too <laughs> yes i agree <laughs> um <laughs> I'm all right with stuff. There's stuff I just will not. With. I don't like green green bean casserole. I don't like, you know, I, it took me a while to come around for stuffing. I don't know. When I was a kid, I was like kind of picky with it. But yeah, uh, even now I'm like, I'm fine with most things. But I don't know why we as a society have decided that like these are the things you have to eat. Oh, yeah. 
just make you can make anything you want. You could you could do, do anything. anything tacos. You want. A little Thanksgiving taco. Yeah, I agree. Like, why not? Who gives a shit? I don't exactly. care. Exactly. Like, yeah, that's the one time of year it's socially acceptable to eat that cranberry pudding that comes in a can. <laughs> like, I no, I don't want the homemade stuff. Give me the can shit that tastes like a tin can. I want that. I want to f- I want I want to see the slice on my plate that's just the I can see the ridge of the can. The ridges. You know, um talking about like Thanksgiving food and everything, you know, you know what we're not like stuffed on and what isn't overstuffed is this record. We're going to be talking about today. It is just <laughs> chock full of like great riffs and like Skinnered riffs and Zeppelin riffs and black Sabbath riffs. Like it's just chock full of it. So, uh, since this is my episode, I'm going to oh. start this song <laughs> oh. today. Today we're talking about, uh, the coalesce album zero one, two revolution in listening. Which until we did the research of this album, I would have called zero twelve, but now I'm not a fool, so I don't say that. <laughs> uh, Austin, I, I think you mentioned that I showed you this record, uh, so I know how you got into it. But Dylan, how did you get into Colesque or this record? So before we talked about doing this record, I had listened to this album one time. And I listened to it when it was either right before I moved to Tennessee or maybe right after it was right as I got into like Converge and I like went down a rabbit hole. I think I, I think I bought the record for like six bucks or something from relapse. Um, so I listened to this botch. Did you get the remaster? I don't think it was the remaster, uh, but it was, it was this record. Um, uh, we are Romans by botch. Uh, may have been the, uh, the really big cave in record, um, older converts, like all those bands that sound like burnt by the sun, stuff like that. And I remember really thinking it was a quick listen, uh, really enjoying it. Uh, and just thinking like, Oh, this is just another really cool, heavy thing that like, um, I enjoyed and definitely gave me a better understanding of like that kind of noisier era of metalcore, that kind of scronkier era with like the weirder guitar parts um, uh, you know, all the bands, like I just listened and you throw on like Dillinger's like first record on there as well, uh, and their EP and all of those bands had like almost like a no core kind of sound. It wasn't necessarily metal core. It wasn't metal. It wasn't hardcore, but like it had all these, like, it was like it was shoved in a blender basically. And like, here's what we got. And here's like some weird noises we're going to add to it as well. Um, but that was my first introduction to it was just that, that first listen. Good stuff. Austin, uh, anything to add other than me making you listen to this album? Did I show you this album at a party as I showed you so many other albums? No, I can't remember exactly why it got brought. Oh, I think I was doing like a thing for the radio and I asked, all right, what are some like Kansas City specific? Kansas City was in the Super Bowl last year and I asked, what is like what are some Kansas City bands like I'm familiar with Spine there might be a few more like contemporary bands from the Kansas City area but I'm like what are some like like it's just kind of hard to like you know I'm like scratching my head thinking and so you you recommended this record which I loved um when I heard it for the first time it definitely felt like botch definitely felt like converge and and whatnot it also has like a lot of like I hate God riffs that opening track just reminded me like all right Let's do I hate God riffs, but make them weirder and just like just add like some some details and flavor to it. Um, But I I remember definitely really, really liking this record for sure. But I I will be honest in saying that I I haven't listened to anything else this band has done. So this is like really my only knowledge or perception of the band, which, again, I really like this record and I want to go back and listen to some of like maybe the EPs and some of the later stuff that came out, but I think, uh, knowing your taste in music, I think you would really stick with Ox and Ox EP. Yeah. Okay. That's like after they broke up for the 9,000th time and got back <laughs> together. Uh, can't wait to but, talk about that, but that, uh, that album and EP has kind of like way more like blues, uh, mm-hmm. influences and, uh, Like the guitar and some of the interviews, the guitarist talks about like listening to like the Americana soundscape and like all these 60s folk artists and how they influenced his songwriting. And uh, 
he made music that sounded more like that than this album. I think uh, our mutual friend Wyatt Dunning got me into this album. Uh, and I think he, if I had to guess, he probably heard it from uh, the the Franklin heavy music, stalwart Chaz Lee, the man that got <laughs> there an entire is. region of heavy music. Uh, an entire region of Kentucky into the same heavy music. Um, so yeah, I listened to this album first and it probably is the Coalesque album that has stuck with me the most. Uh, it's more, I think the ones before this one are more like hardcore, uh, oriented more like, uh, scream along chanty stuff. Maybe, uh, when you suggested this record to do, I was like, this is perfect because like, you're the one person I know that's really into, I don't know Chaz as well as I know you. I don't know Wyatt as well as I know you, but I know that you're the one person I know personally that's really into like this style and this era of metalcore. Uh, like really, like you still listen to bands like The Network, uh, Ed Gein, uh, like, you know, prior to what we know about it, like some of those early Gaza records, like that is definitely your thing. And I've played music with you long enough to know like, when I heard this record again, I was like, yeah, that's a swindle thing. Like that's, <laughs> that's how he plays. That's the type. Yep. Like that's it to a T. So like even some of those early converge records, like petitioning empty sky or anything like that, like that's, that is like blueprint you to me. Yeah. To uh, peel the curtain back. I, I mentioned, I mentioned it in a message, but I almost picked raise the bullshit flag by Phoenix bodies, uh, which is only a 15 minute album. But there is like no information about that band <laughs> on the internet at all. I was Marvable. like, uh, well, we can't just talk about yeah. a 15 minute album for 30 minutes. So I mean, I kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Colesque, as Austin mentioned, a uh, band from Kansas City. Uh, I think this band started when everyone in the band was pretty much a teenager. I think. Uh, Starting a band as a teenager is not like that wild. Uh, I think maybe for this band, it was a little weird because it was almost everyone's first band and they didn't start this band until they were like 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think the vocalist, Sean, may have even been married and might have even had kids when this band formed. Uh, but the guitarist and the original basis of this band were started a uh rap rock or metal rap group sign of the times and sean ingram the vocalist just out of nowhere on christmas day one year in 1993 moved to uh syracuse new york because he loved um he loved earth crisis so much yeah that's always funny to like you love a band so much i guess he had like had some exchanges with some of the people in that scene like straight edge hardcore and 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 uh you know, vegan, uh, straight edge kind of hardcore dudes. Uh, he did live in a house with an original member of <laughs> Earth Crisis, I found as well. Uh, I believe it is, uh, let me see if I can find it here. I had it a second ago. Uh, ben Reed. He lived in a house with Ben Reed, the, I guess the original guitarist of uh, Earth Crisis in a house. And so he only lived there for like a few months, right? Like maybe like real mad. <laughs> And so he <laughs> he moved back or he came back uh like over Easter another holiday break just to kind of visit and uh you know all right Sean's back in town you know we're doing this 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 rap rock band I guess here's an instrumental uh tape we'd love you to audition for the band and so I think at the time he was kind of maybe not jiving with some of the more militant attitude of some of those like straight edge vegan hardcore kids in Syracuse. So he was like, ah, I like those guys. All right. I think I do far better here in the Midwest. And so that was kind of the thing. Oh, Sean's back in town. Let's get him in the band. Like he's in the band. Let's do it. So, um, I've never listened. I've truthfully never listened to earth crisis. I know they are a very legendary band. Um, you know, they were a big deal. They were a victory records band. They were a huge deal at that point, maybe around the time, like, hate breed uh, got really big as well. Uh, all I truthfully know is they're vegan straight edge uh, and they have a song called firestorm. Uh, I know about that song. Um, 
Now, Swindle and I got a chance to see Converge in like 2010. Uh, and someone in the crowd while Converge was playing kept yelling, play Firestorm, play Firestorm. <laughs> Nate Newton, the bass player, gets on the mic and he just goes, I would rather play fucking Freebird than play Firestorm. <laughs> and backs off and they kick into the next song. Oh I just God. had to bring that up. That's hilarious. Dylan, I think you would like Earth Crisis, at least like the early shit. That EP. It's metallic. No, like in through the early 2000s, like in to breed the killers because it's like metal. It's like hardcore metal, metal, metallic hardcore. Yeah. That the EP All Out War was the one that yeah. apparently oh, caused perfect. him to move to Syracuse, New York. <laughs> so if you listen to that record, you you ain't shit unless, unless you actually live it. That, that, uh, decision to move to new york syracuse like really affected that dude kind of into this the era that like he's doing these interviews that we like did research for because like lyrics on 012 are a lot of them are about like those militant straight edge people and like in the interviews that i read and listened to for this episode like he is still talking about like how militant straight edge people are like akin to militant religious people, like militant Christians. And like this four months really had an effect on the show. He was dude. mad for years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess to be fair, when this album came out in the night in the late nineties, that shit was way more prevalent than it's been since I any of the three of us were into like a scene of met heavy music, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've never really like I kn- friends with straight edge people. I know straight edge people. I don't know if I've ever really like clashed with people who I've always heard the, you know, the stories of like dudes, like slapping, slapping beer cans out of people's you hands. Know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I've never seen that ha- at a show before. I know it's existed or whatever, yeah. but it's never, I've, it's never been something I've crossed path with. I've never witnessed it either. You know, um, you know, I, when I met Swindle, I was straight edge, uh, or at least edge adjacent. Um, and like all of our friends were basically at that point. And, um, it's like, I, I, I never remember see, being in any sort of contact with people that did that. Even like bands, like I would end up going to see that had straight edge members. I didn't see them do it. I didn't see them make some sort of like statement about that. Um, now the Christian bands I got stuck seeing, they felt the need to preach all day long. Uh, but the uh, straight edge guys, eh, I didn't see that. I guess the nineties was just a really rough time. So, uh, Sean moved to Syracuse, uh, moved back four months later, joined, was asked to jo- join Colesk almost immediately. Uh, they, and I think he like wrote a song almost immediately that appeared on their first EP. Uh, I think uh, they may have released uh, maybe two EPs or something and went on their first tour. Uh, after after their first tour, they immediately broke up. Perfect. <laughs> Was... Um- was this when they were referred to as Breach? Is that is that right? Is that the name? Uh, they I'm changed. They when Sean joined the band, they changed the name from Breach to Coalesque because okay. there apparently was a European band named Breach. So Makes they pre, they changed it pretty early on. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, they get they get back from this first tour, which is with the band One Hundred Eight. I don't okay. know. Oh, okay. If y'all know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they're um, are they here like Kri- here Krishna band? Yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah, that's that's some rad wow. shit. It's got members yeah. that were in uh, a couple other here Krishna bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, Inside Out. That's it. One yep. of the people from Inside Out is in 108. Uh, and, and actually, the guitarist of Cole Esk was a Hare Krishna person for mm. a long time, but I think isn't now. Um, but yeah, they go out on their first tour with 108 somehow. And uh, uh, they come back. Bloodlet? Is that... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, but they're not. Her, they're not here, Krishna. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Definitely not. That's that's some pretty aggro shit. Not uh, to say 108's not either. 108 is not 
they're like super fucking political. No, it's and super I, Hare Krishna. No, it's just it was aggro. Like it was just really aggressive music. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they go on that tour. When they come back, the drummer that had been the original drummer uh, of the rap rock group wanted to kick Sean out of the band and have uh, have like tryouts for the new vocalist. One of the Sean shows up to practice while uh, what's his name? It's like James uh, James Dewey's. Uh, yeah, James Dewey's is trying out for the vocals. Uh, James DeWeese would later become the drummer of Cole-esque, but uh, at the time that James is trying out for vocals and Sean walks in to James trying out for vocals, they start a fight and they dissolve (laughs) the band. This band? (laughs) On the spot. We're not even like that far into the episode and I'm like, how did this band exist for as long as it did? This is like the fucking Eagles. They hate each other. (laughs) <laughs> hey it's it's remarkable like it's absolutely like the band has been around like five years at this point maybe maybe even just four and they've broken up three times uh they've tried to reform they they kicked out a vocalist without kicking him out he shows up and it's like it's like an episode of mari or like springer like he rolls in kicks the door in like goes for it The, you know, the jilted lover runs off on the left side of the screen. Like it's just going for it. You know, imagine rolling in and like having no idea you're being asked to leave this band or kicked out, whatever they want to refer to it as. And I would have been mad. And you walk in and there's the guy that's playing drums that wants you out behind the mic. Like, is that just a sneak left hook? Just a cross? Like, come on. That is, this is just, this writes itself. So they break up. Then they reform back in like 96, right? <laughs> right. The, the original guitarist uh, wants to reform the band. So he calls the bassist. He calls Sean. And I think he actually calls uh, the original drummer. But the original drummer is in college now. So he doesn't rejoin the band. And Jane, as I mentioned, James Dewey's, uh who was trying out for Sean spot becomes the drummer of Cole speaking, speaking of college, like a funny thing that, that I, well, not a funny thing, <laughs> but this band, you know, like this guy, the, the original drummer obviously had some like priorities. Like you mentioned, a lot of these members are yeah. like early teens, um, you know, maybe like graduating high school, entering college by this point. And, uh, I think James DeWeese got kicked out of college because of Coalesque. He was on the road with this band so much that he missed a bunch of class. And then they like were like, yeah, you can't just not come to school. (laughs) We're just that dude's that dude was also on the get up kids, Um, which is like a band I've heard Swindle talk about for off and on for many years. Uh, And, you know, like I'm pretty sure the man, oh man guys would talk about that band a lot, too. Uh, James Dewey's was in a band years later called Reggie and the Full Effect that I saw. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I went to a show when I was like 16 that I got. It was a free ticket. Hey, come with us. I was like, sure. What could it be? It was a lot of bands I don't care anything about. I think it was Cute is What We Aim For opened, then Reggie and the Full Effect, and then Hello Goodbye? Yeah, yeah. All these like very like, I would call them teeny bopper bands at that one point. But the wild thing that kind of, I'm glad someone agrees with me on that one. Uh, Reggie and the Full Effects like dead middle of the set. So they're loading up and these guys look older, obviously. Had no idea who this guy was. They get up there, they start playing their stuff. And I was like, why do I recognize the bass player? He's left-handed. It's fucking Paul Gray from Slipknot without his mask on. Wow. Weird. He's doing oh, touring bass for this band. Yeah. So they played a part of a Slipknot song called Sick. It's just like the riff. And then they also played like Raining Blood. Interesting. Like, That's where am, where am I fucking at? <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. Uh, uh, James has been in a lot of stuff. Like you mentioned, yes, Get he Up has. Kids, which is another Kansas City band. I think Get Up Kids and Coalesque, like they did some did splits split. together. The split. They covered, they each, covered other's each other's songs. Other songs. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Um, I think uh, James like eventually did some stuff for them on like keyboard and then became like a full member mm-hmm. uh, for a brief time. He was a touring member of My Chem. And then became a full member very briefly. 
Uh, so yeah, he's him and Frank Iero of My Chemical Romance were like have a lot of in, tie-ins. Yeah, they were they were involved in uh, some side projects together, some offshoots. I know he's like Leathermouth, I think. Yeah, uh, there's that band. Uh, he's on like a um, Gerard Way like solo record as well. So there's definitely some tie-ins there. But yeah, busy guy for sure. All these guys are busy. I mean, Sean like started businesses like outside of this. You know, he's got a screen printing company. Uh, he does like merch table. There's a does a bike company as well. I'm not exactly sure what that's about, but it's I know bike some, polo. Yeah, there's some BMX tie-ins with this band in particular. There sure is. Um, we'll get into in a minute, yep. but yeah, definitely some interesting kind of like little roots here and there. Little the tie-ins. background of this band is wild. I was not expecting it to be just like a you know, it's like watching the fucking Notebook. You know, do you really want them to be together? They're just screaming at each other for like an hour and a half. It's like, all right, let's see what. And then you see the art that comes from it. You're like, all right. It's yeah. Like, fuck. A funny thing. A funny thing about the bike polo thing uh, is Sean in a podcast was like, yeah, I was out. I was also like he started the company, but he was also one of the people doing the bike polo. And he had his bike on the tires had like artwork from ox the album the oh like that's star crazy thing. yeah and some person was like wearing a jane doe t-shirt at this bike polo event and was just yelling at sean like hey what's that from like i know what that's from what where, where, where is that yeah. artwork and he just like kept yelling at sean the whole game and this one dude from sean's team just like goes over to the guy and he was like Yo, he was in Cole-esque. Shut up. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Amazing. Beautiful. You're a phony. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they get back together with James DeWeese on drums and they release two full lengths and like roughly four splits. A Led Zeppelin covers album. Well, yeah. And that uh, <laughs> cover album. <laughs> The splits are wild. They released a split with Napalm Death, uh, which is insane uh, that this that Cole esque could just jump on a split with Napalm Death out of nowhere. I think. uh, I think Sean, somebody mentioned that, like, one of the members of Cole esque was just a such a huge fan of Hydra Head Records that he called. uh. I don't know if it was Aaron Turner, but someone from Hydra Head, he called him like every day uh, just <laughs> to like just to be friends with him. He wasn't yeah. even at that point. He wasn't trying to get on the label, but he was just like trying to be friends with this person. I uh, want to be your friend so bad. And they kept their like friendship up to uh, the point that like the person on Hydra Head, they were like going to release the Napalm Death release and were like, Cole esque would probably have a good song or two to put on this release. So I guess that's how it goes. Hell yeah. If you want to release Hell. music with cool bands, just like annoy the <laughs> fuck out of somebody that runs a record label. Call Brian Slagle right now. Oh man. <laughs> what do you mean? Hey man, we, I know you're a Raiders we, game. We know somebody who does that. <laughs> how does keep Hey. Brian Slagle's a good friend. That's all I know. He's a patient man and a good e- friend. E- yeah. Jesus. E- anyway, e- sorry. Uh, they also released a split with Converge and a split with, uh, I think, Nashville band. Today is the day. They're oh, okay. Nashville, right? Whoa, I forgot about them. I shouldn't, uh, but I forgot about them. Sometime around this point, they released or they signed an agreement with Relapse Records. Because of this agreement, they get a like a uh, payout in advance of a record for six thousand dollars. And while they're on their West Coast tour, this van that they just spent six thousand dollars on from their label breaks down uh, in the middle of a tour and they all go back home to Kansas City and uh, they're done. Wow. With they Cole they pulled an Abe Simpson walking into that brothel and walking right out. <laughs> they were just like, whoop, just right in, right out. Um, they, it was a two leg tour. So I, I can only imagine they were probably like two weeks, right? I, I think they did the East coast run just fine, but I guess something happened on that East coast run and that van was just like, yeah, man, 
we're dead. We're done. Yeah. Um, put me out. Put a slug in me. I'm good. I mean, some, we've we've seen it many, many times since. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of money in this form of music. And less you now. Know, if if a van, if your if your lifeline breaks down, it's it's very hard to like try to get that back. So uh, and it, it seems like there were probably already problems between them. Anyway. Oh, my so, God. It's you just know, like, maybe could you imagine that van? Could you imagine the tension in that van? Oh, man. Just like sitting in there. You know, there's some poor bastard that, that was in the band at the time that was probably like the odd guy out that was just like, I just I just want to have fun. And there's at least two parties in that band that were just like the most tense human beings. Oh, sure. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably aren't as familiar with them as I am, but uh, Lamb of God put out a DVD years ago called Philadelphia. And they, there's a point where they're in Ireland where like the vocalist Randy and the car player Mark get in a fucking fight in like oh, the God. streets of Ireland. They're all just on the bus and there's so much tension and one of the guys looks at Mark, the guitar player, is like, you all right? Go in the jail, Mark? Yep. As he's lacing up his <laughs> shoes. <laughs> just, they go out, bap, bap. The next day, show goes on. Yeah. You know what's funny, too, is that, um, you, you know, we mentioned Relapse. I think they had also worked with Earache. And I feel like that's kind of an interesting choice for a band like this that, you know, I feel like most hardcore bands would probably want to work with a hardcore label or like a, an adjacent label, not labels that were kind of like earache, you know, by this point, definitely known for being like a he- extreme heavy metal label and to want to work with a, like a heavy metal label as a hardcore band. is kind of interesting to me. Um, but yeah, that that's short lived, I guess with relapse there. Man. At least. <laughs> well, they, the, wow. the ox, the oxy <laughs> yeah. P or the ox album and the oxy P were both released on relapse. Okay. Once they got yeah. back together. But um, uh, that wasn't even the end of this chapter with Relapse <laughs> because Relapse bought them a van. Uh, yep. So, so they, they break down so and when, then they bought them another van? No. Relapse no. bought them this van that breaks down. The yeah. advance they, break they got. Up, they break up even though <laughs> and when they called Relapse, I assume Sean is the person that's speaking to Relapse. I hope. Uh, Sean's like Hey, like we're done. Like we, our van broke down on tour. We don't have money to have another van, uh, and we all don't like each other. Relapse says, "Oh no, you owe us. You're money? putting on an album. <laughs> <laughs> like we signed you. We gave you six thousand dollars. You're putting out a record. So Colesk, not a band anymore. They don't have any music written, but they have to put out an album. So what do they do? They write." zero one two revolutions in just listening <laughs> it's it's remarkable when i when i found out that tidbit of the story i like immediately it just clicked i was like oh this is this is just a hey buddy this is all <laughs> this is like the they broke up in like 98 the the most the time before this record they broke up in 98 so there was a period of time probably 6 months where they weren't together and like relapse is like finding out like hey you remember when you loaned us like 6k and we bought a van and some new gear yeah well man, we just don't want to do this anymore and relapse all albeit an independent label is probably like you know what you sign this we get our money or you put out a record and whoever the person that was like let's just do the record was just like, God, we could put something together in like a week, I bet. And yeah. it just happened to be a solid fucking record. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It could have been <laughs> so <Define>. much worse. <laughs> yeah, it just happened to define a genre of like <laughs> 2000s hardcore. And it whatever. was just, it was basically just, <laughs> yeah, just like, get it done. Wow. I hate all of you. And everyone's in the room just like, <laughs> actually, no one was in the room with each other. That's what's even better. It was just like, God, this is get this shit done. Yeah. Didn't he play shows for this record? Right. Just I mean, zero support. Blah, baffling. Like to come out with a record that is like as crucial to a subgenre, crucial to a genre. You know, metalcore is what it is. It's like it's a blending of metal and hardcore. So like you have this weird outlier record released and it's like we're done click nothing for 10 years so this album uh recorded by a man named ed rose in uh red house studios which i assume is in kansas city 
uh, bands like a lot. This person, Ed, has recorded a, like a whole genre of music, essentially other than metalcore. And mm-hmm. it's uh, late 90s and early 2000s emo, like the Appleseed cast, Small Brown Bike, Casket Lottery, Boy's Life. Uh, the Outlier, for some and? reason, is Puddle of Mud. I don't know. He also <laughs> recorded Puddle of Mud. <laughs> Uh, I don't really know who like the engineering is done by none of the most of the other people that are involved with the recording in this album don't have like a bunch of other right um, credits but one of the people there are two people that are listed in the mastering of this album one of them is Scott Hall I'm not really sure why there are two people mastering but my own my best approximation is like a re-release came out in 2008 and it was also on relapse. Uh, It was in fact uh, relapse's first vinyl release of this album. So I imagine that they got Scott Hall to release, to mix this album for that. That makes sense. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. He did a lot of stuff. He, he mastered a lot of stuff for relapse. He probably still does to this point. The album, like I said, it came out on relapse the first pressing of vinyl was on Hydra Head, mm-hmm. but uh, that is to the international market mostly, I believe. Uh, and in 2008, Relapse pressed it for the first time on vinyl. It's wild to think, too, that like um, this record came out in 1999. So it's on the cusp of being 25 years old. I mean, yeah. this, this coming year, 25th anniversary. Uh, and in a prior episode, we were talking about No Effects is the Decline. These albums came out a week within each other. Wild. As, as well. Crazy. Like, and there was, we had no reason to select these albums that way. We're just like, hey, what's something cool we should talk about? And it just, there you go. Um, but I mean, that's, it, it, I'm not completely familiar with all of Hydra Head's releases because they've released so much and their hands are all over everything. Uh, I mean, it's owned, I believe it's still owned by Aaron Turner, who was an ISIS, uh, Old Man Gloom, and, and many other acts I'm forgetting. But like... Sumac. That's right. That's right. He, and he, Aaron Turner's in that as well. Um, Aaron Turner, uh, when he was an ISIS, ISIS was on Ipecac Recordings, which was owned by Mike Patton. But he would still handle vinyl releases through Hydrahead for a lot of the uh, ISIS releases and stuff like... Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there is a big relationship between like Hydra head relapse and all of those kind of subsidiaries like death wish stuff like that. Uh, because a lot of those bands kind of like interlock. I mean, I think there's the, uh, the poacher diaries, which is the agoraphobic nosebleed and converge split that was released on uh, relapse. But I think death wish did its own variation just recently. So as a person who isn't, entirely familiar with this band a lot of this i'm learning as we're recording this right now which is great a lot this is very fun to talk about uh from a musical standpoint there are some fucking ass beaten tracks on this record love this record uh as i mentioned a lot of it sounds like new orleans sludge mixed with you know a lot of uh like math core metal core uh acts of the time botch you know converge what have you that first song what happens on the road always comes home is like there's some I hate uh, I hate God grooves uh, at certain points, and then there's just like all these kind of sort of weird uh, you know guitar runs and stuff. I wonder now having heard some of the touring stories and some of the uh, you know infighting of the band, it kind of feels like the song to me the way I interpreted it, I, the way I interpreted the song uh, kind of sounds like maybe that fueled the lyrical themes of this track a yeah. lot for sure yeah yeah um you know going out on the road for long periods of time uh with maybe nothing to show for it there's a line that says um it all seems trivial to ever leave again i will never leave again <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. like a big one he was married and had at least two kids at this point um because he has like two kids he has four kids but two of them are a lot younger than the other two so Sean at least had a lot of shit going on at this point. Yeah, which uh, totally understandable. And, you know, what do you, what would you rather do? Uh, you know, be <laughs> fighting no on money. the road. Yeah, make no money. Be fighting on the road. You know, you get your van shut down. There's a label hounding you for a record. 
spend time with my family. I miss my family. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so, but there's also seems to be like in this song, like a longing for, you know, maybe those early days of kind of touring and being young. And, yeah. you know, there's even like a sample of like kids playing at the end of the before song it got, too. Before it got complicated, before all the other hands were in the pie, right? Yeah. Um, one thing of note about this record is the lyrics are all personal. Every single lyric on this album is personal. It has nothing to do with Coles at all. It's all just like Sean just going like, nope, this is about me. This is personal. Every single thing I'm singing about is personal. The band has no effect on it. Uh, and I mean, that also alludes to the fact of kind of Sean's take on the record, which is like, this is the last thing we're doing. I'm going to make it count. This album, uh, I mean, obviously it's like a forerunner to, like we said, the metal core and kind of math core and mm-hmm. maybe even a little bit of grind from the mid 2000s. Uh, some of that comes through in the songwriting comes through. I think later in the album, the thing that's wild to me is like the first two songs. This, the first song is only three parts and they like that one riff, uh, in the first song, they just stick with that riff. The, the guitarist was just like, Oh yo, this is a catchy riff. Like this is going to be most of, this is two thirds of the song. And they really, and that kind of is a theme with the album is like, Maybe it's because uh, they were already broken up and the guitarist didn't want to put a lot of effort into writing 10 million parts, but they really found a way of finding the really good riff in each song and sticking with the really good riff in every song. So bringing that up and bringing up how they kind of like beat a riff into submission. uh, I like that effect. I like using You know, you get one good riff and you just kind of use variations of it in the rest of the song. It's still the same riff. You're just adjusting it slightly to have a different impact. And I like that. And there may be a degree of that of the amount of time they spent writing this record because I believe the guitar player wrote it in three days. I wrote all the parts in three days with an acoustic guitar in his grandfather's house. They then practiced it a week straight from 7 p.m. to like 1 a.m. after the Get Up Kids would get done practicing at their practice space. And that was it. That was it. Uh, Had a very loose like uh, writing process, loose structure. So that adds a lot of the impact to how the riffs are. They're like, we have this great meaty riff in here. Like, let's just beat the hell out of it. I mean, that first that first track, that main riff of that first track kind of sounds like your standard minor scale kind of pattern that uh, whole half kind of progression right there. Um, But then they do just different variations on it, like these pull-offs and these bends and this like weird, like almost like triplet feel kind of like staccato part at the end of it that is just really fucking rad. And then it's got like um, these very like mid-90s kind of era Pantera vocals on it with like the spoken part kind of buried under the mix, the the kind of Phil Anselmo rant stuff uh, that just fits in really well. Like it's, it's remarkable how I having not listened to anything prior to this album from the band, but it's remarkable how like and how much of an outlier this record is because I've heard Ox and Oxy P and it really doesn't sound reminiscent to this at all. He does have like a, a very like Phil Anselmo style vocal delivery, uh, you know, just to kind of tie it back to, the guitar riffing being similar to that Nola sludge, you know, with a little bit of a, a flair to it. It's like, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit off air, Dylan and I, that it's kind of of the time. I'm sure these guys listen to a lot of Pantera at the time, or at least, yeah, at least Sean did. I mean, being one of the, the being one of the biggest bands in that, of that time, it, you know, I'm sure it had an effect. He said in like maybe an interview with NPR or something when when Ox and Ox EP came out, uh, he said that like Phil was his not his biggest influence for the way he wrote like the words right. on the page, but the but Phil was like the biggest influence on the way he like delivered the lines and the way his voice sounds. Yep, it's uh very like. It's it's intense and very like um, demanding, right? It's just very just upfront with how the how the phrasing's done, everything. 
Uh, the only other guy I've ever kind of heard do the same thing is uh, Tim from the band VOD from New York has a very similar style to this. Uh, but yeah, it's being a band from the 90s. I'm sure, as Austin said, a couple of these guys were probably listening to those early Pantera records. Being in the Midwest uh, where, you know, that type of music was king. Um, I mean, adding to that, like the kind of Southern almost groove, almost boogie to that. The first couple tracks and the couple of the other tracks on here, uh, swindles, right though. The first half of the record almost has more of that style. Whereas the back half of the record almost has a more extreme, maybe more experimental style with like some of the samples that are being used, uh, some of the sound effects that they're using. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that first track just sets the tempo, sets the standard of what you're going to hear for the next 24 minutes. Moving right along, uh, we got cowards.com is track number two. Uh, I think I, I wrote for the song going back to my uh, previous point. I think like the song structure is also three parts for the song. It's like just A, B, C, and then just repeated the same thing over again. Uh, those are the parts. Uh, so they had really found like the riff that they wanted to play in this song too and uh stuck with that and uh very of the time of the late 90s the song is about uh internet message board drama apparently yep um i would i don't think um lamb goat was around at this point i think they arrived a few years later but probably a lot of precursor to like lamb goat uh i read an interview on the band uh from their hall of fame induction through decibel magazine number 37 by the way um that a couple of the guys didn't even that that issue of the magazine released in 08 a couple of the guys didn't even have internet to like 07 08 like wow. for <laughs> holy shit like, Damn, Missouri. Like early <laughs> era here. Like, could you imagine just being like, oh yeah, there's this thing called the internet and they're talking mad shit on you guys. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, no, yeah, they're dorks. Th- th- yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you're going to eat the shit that we shit out that's made of the shit that we ate of you. Like, yeah. Oh my God. But good song. Really intense. Really intense. Um. Sean screaming his head off. There's like a really cool, I always nod human remains, but they do like the kind of choppy guitar part, but in the vocal part. Yes. Of the the outro, outro, it almost like sounds like effect. a CD skipping. Yeah. 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 Yep. I, I love that. Uh, the next song after that, uh, burn everything that bears our name. Scathing. Which I think is one of, one of the songs about those, uh, pesky, Vegan straight edge hardliners <laughs> from Syracuse that Sean hates. You know this track uh, is like this track is like proggy as shit. It like, is. <laughs> it's got that distorted bass line in it, dude. He has taken that thing for a walk. Like they, yeah. he <laughs> is, he is running down that neck, uh, which was cool. There's some like interesting little, um, you know, little parts outside yeah. of the bass. There's like some wah. There's a wah pedal yeah. on this track. Yes. Oh, yeah. Pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, definitely interesting song. The part in the middle of the song, uh, it's like kind of dead middle. It's almost like a breakdown. Uh, the the vote, Sean is kind of like repeating uh, burn, burn it or burn it all like over and over again. I don't know what the fuck is happening in the riff. Like it's noise. Uh, but I love that part. I fucking love that breakdown. You know, some say that Sean is still upset about those Syracuse guys. <laughs> some say. Um, and, you know, if this record if this record proves it, he probably still is. I mean, it may have just been a moment in time, but, God, he moved away from New York in, like, 94. Like, woof. Whatever happened, he is still mad about. And it, 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 it breeds great material. I love I love some of these uh, other song titles too. While the jackass operation spins its wheels, sometimes selling out is waking up. That okay? I have the touch on that one because you and I have made jokes about this for years that it's not selling out; it's buying, buying in. in. And yeah. in reality, it is just like going, "Huh." <laughs> oh, That's man, a lot got, easier. Yeah, I got a I, I got a bed to sleep in man, at the end my, of the night. 
My Her. fucking my fucking knee hurts, dude. <laughs> God, how many how many more moons of my hammy do I have to eat? How you know do I have to walk into a McDonald's and ask the cashier? I slept on for, my pillow like, weird like last night, and my my neck was fucked up for like a whole day and a half. Where like it even hurt to put shampoo through my hair. Could you imagine being like, ah oh, man? The math core, uh, <laughs> the math core bills aren't getting paid. <laughs> it, is, it is debatable if I got a hernia from lifting weights or moving a base cab for 15 years. <laughs> it is debatable which one, you know, one of those pays nothing and the other one pays nothing. I'm still lifting weights, but moving an eight by 10 base cab ain't happening anymore. I think sometimes selling out is waking up is one of the other songs that's about the straight, the hard line straight. I edge. knew it. Uh, the la- the final, like not the final, but one of the last stanzas, the lyrics is they can candy coat their hard line roots all they want, but I've seen the tapes. Don't ever let these clowns define you. <laughs> oh, I love, oh, I fucking love that. God Dude, damn. that is a level of like pettiness that like, um, a British actor, a British comedian would have. That is so good. Um, this next song is probably my favorite on the record. Shit list. No, the next song is uh, where the hell is Rick Thorne oh, these days? Okay, okay. Um, I love the story around that. I like the song itself, but the whole story is almost like it's a tribute to this BMX guy that I had no idea who it was till I saw a photo. I was like, fuck, I know exactly who this guy is. Um, it was it was a BMX guy. That Sean, I guess, was a big fan of in the 90s. And Sean would go to the, like these BMX or skate, you know, shows or anything like that. And I guess this guy, Rick Thorne, would always be there and he'd be in like a Cro Mag shirt or like you, you name it, seven seconds, whatever it was. And Sean would start talking to him. And like this Rick guy would like go, Hey man, I have these like old records that I've listened to for decades. Like I'll sell them to you. And he'd sell them like these original press, like seven seconds or like these old hardcore albums for like a buck. And so it was an introduction for him to like hardcore music. So like, I thought this was a really good, like little tribute to just that time in his life that made him happy. Yeah. I I'd read like Rick Thorne and another BMX writer, David McCoy, Mm -hmm. uh, who he like became friends with kind of introduced him like to the world of straight edge hardcore. And Maybe he had dabbled with like alcohol and substances, you know, kind of early in his like high school years and then discovered this. And then that was the world he had found himself in. Uh, the song title alone kind of reminds me of a lot of it. it it's kind of reminiscent of this time for sure. Like it makes me think of that Ed Gein song, like Paul Rubin, you know, the I don't know. The, yeah, yeah. The long yeah. To sort of title yeah, uh, like that's very it's a very in traditional thing in this kind of subgenre. What's the fucking botch song? Uh, uh, see Thomas Howell as the soul man or whatever. Yes, exactly. The the race yeah, trader yeah. uh <laughs> diss track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this that song is definitely like the most uh pre metalcore song because it's less than two minutes long and there's like six different parts just crammed into this two minute song. They were like they were like let's get these parts. I got. Seven extra riffs. Let's fit them in this one song. Yeah. I can't stand looking at you. Let's just get it done. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually like the, I really like the first half of this record, like the A side, because it's just so intense and straightforward, but I really thoroughly enjoy this B side to this record a lot. Um, it, it's a little bit more experimental. I don't know what it is. Like it doesn't lose any intensity. It just becomes more of what I like about this record. So moving on to the next song. Jesus in the year 2000 next on the shit list. I love that. Uh, I think there there is like a, at the beginning of the song, there's a sample of maybe like a radio uh, Christian church radio program or television program being played. But uh, once the music kicks in. That fucking riff at the beginning <laughs> of the song is the fucking riff like that's one of the catchiest riffs of the whole fucking album. Yeah. To be honest. It's a good one. I like yeah. the piano that they kind of oh, like yeah. a, have the, in the, the beginning of the song too, that kind of bridges yeah. the the radio to the, the, the riff. I thought it was like a really nice touch, but the one thing that like kind of bothered me about it was that when you're listening to it, 
it cuts out very abruptly. Like it doesn't just like fade out like every right, night. Right. And I could be wrong. I just I, when I heard it, it was like I could hear that like uh, that track of the song. Like oh, that I'm sure gotcha. layer. It just kind of sure cuts that out. Cut. Yeah, it was it was kind of abrupt. But the riff itself. it's Yeah, that shit rules. And I think uh, I think this is the only song on the album with a hook like a repeating vocal chorus line. Uh, and that hook comes around every time that fucking big riff is comes back around with a title like this. It's funny because like, I believe there were a couple guys in the band that were um, religious at the time, uh, primarily Sean. Christian Sean was, and I think one of the other guys might've, might've been involved with it. Um, but maybe not as, as extensive as Sean was at the time. But there's quite a few mention, mentions of Jesus on the album, uh, even though it is not a religious album. But funny side note about this is, I guess Sean had an interaction with somebody at one point that was like, you know, that is the best song I've ever heard about John the Baptist in my life. And <laughs> he's like, it's not about that, but hey, we'll take it. <laughs> that person had never heard of uh, a cursed song out of the Baptist. <laughs> or, or had ever seen the Cryptopsy album cover. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I guess there's technically two more songs, but yeah. really there's only one more uh, traditional song left left on the album. Uh, it's titled Counting Murders and Drinking Beer. Uh, the $46,000 Escape. What which, could that possibly fucking mean? <laughs> so I, okay. I, I think the 40s, yeah. I think the song is about getting out of a pretty poor neighborhood yeah. where some violence took place and yep. like the, the $46,000 part was probably like the price of a new house or yeah. oh, okay. different house or something. That, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what it is. Like Sean and his wife had bought a house in um, a really rough area and all these terrible things that happened. And like, um, I believe there was a guy that lived next door to him that got murdered. Um, a prostitute moved across the street um, and like, it was just a very rough area of where they lived and it was basically him getting out. So as Swindle said, that 46,000 was probably either about the amount of a new house or the amount of what they were trying to sell that house for. Yeah. And then you got the noise track basically at the end. It's like, you know, machines kind of running it and maybe like some clocks ticking. There's piano on it. We got to fill some time out for relapse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to run that clock guys. They want how much, how much time do they want? It's got to be 24 minutes or 24 full minutes. Fuck. All right. Figure it out. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of tracks like this just because it's like, I know what you're doing. Um, cause I've been in those situations where it's like, we got to make time. Um, and a lot of bands did this in the nineties and maybe there was a reasoning behind this, but I truthfully don't believe it. The favorite part of the track is that the tail end. You can hear someone audibly going, you guys are dicks. <laughs> <laughs> if it was the person recording them, who could they have been talking to? Because there wasn't more than one person in the room at the same time. Everybody recorded their shit differently. Yeah. He, he just put that Except on there and he was like, he was like collectively like you guys are dicks. Like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're all recording individually. So it's like tracking. They don't see each other. It's recorded in roughly a week. I think like drums were done in a day and a half and James went on tour with the get up kids once he finished. Um, I mean, this record was recorded real quick and with intent to get it out, to pay off a debt. Uh, and it just happened to be a really good record just by them not caring. Cause even the guitar player, I believe his name is Jess Steinberger or Steinberg, something like that. He even states like the well was dry. He's like the well just kind of ran dry. You know, I had, I didn't really have any sense for an accomplishment anymore. Like I was kind of just out of it. I was done with this band. And he was never really in anything else. No, you're right. He did. He did this. That was, that was it. He did coalesce. And it's once the record was out, like all the guys in the band kind of have like mixed feelings about it. Like some guys like it. Some guys think it was just a waste of time. Some guys thought it was just like, Hey, we had to pay off a debt. Uh, it was very clear that maybe those guys had some issues with one another. Maybe there were two people in the band that had more of an issue with the, 
uh, the other one, uh, because years later when they reformed for like the umpteenth time in like 08, 06, whatever it was, uh, I think it was all of the same guys except the drummer. I don't think James was part of the band at that point. So it's very obvious that that could have been him. But then again, the band broke up again. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they yeah. technically broke up after 2009, but they were just like, we'll get back together if we want to write a new album. And they just haven't wanted to write a new album. Makes sense. Hey, that's fair. So kind of summing up this episode, why this record? Obviously, the history is is pretty interesting, but, you know, it's like 20, 24 minutes. Why this record versus some of their other releases? You know, Ox, obviously, we talked about a little bit. Why does this stand out to you? What what was the thing that was like that you found so profound about it that you wanted to talk about it for an entire episode? Well, since this is a show about the riff. That's it. The. The riffs on this album are killer. The riffs are great, and they put no effort into writing them. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, bah, yeah, have at it. It's, it's like Hank selling propane. There's no effort. It's pretty interesting what can happen. You know, like, like I said earlier, this could have been a train wreck. This could have been yeah. a pile of dog shit. We've like talked about bands who really half assed a record yeah. just to fulfill a, con- a contractual ob- obligation and it's probably not a great record just because the heart wasn't in it. This is maybe a similar thing where I'm just doing this because I guess I have to, but yeah. it defined an era of aggressive right. music. I mean, it did. So that's pretty funny in itself. <laughs> if you get down to it and you look at kind of some of those defining early metalcore records like this, it's, you know, um, Botches, We Are the Romans. Uh, what's the big cave in record, Swindle? Um, until, until until a heart, heart stops. Yes, until a heart stops. Uh, Jane Doe, which came a couple years later. Uh, I mean, these are three to four really big records that came out that like define this early era of like metalcore like this. So this band, this album, like they have a lot of time signature stuff. Like mm-hmm. a lot of this album is weird timing. Uh, a, I don't really think the guitarist new i'm sure i don't think he was like i'm gonna write this part in 11 8 yeah i think he just like played what felt good to him uh and but also like it's not uh technical in like the time or key signature Mm -hmm. way of like a lot of the songs are in chromatic key signatures yeah the guitarist uh, and the vocalist they both know that they're not like we we sat and wrote this in like the Phrygian mode of E minor or whatever. They just kind of wrote what felt good in uh, that way. I don't really know that this album could exist now with like. Super technical death metal and like. uh Wild grindcore that's like at 280 BPM or whatever, uh, but. Since this came out in 1999, it completely ushered in like I'm sure even like Burnt by the Sun took a lot yep. of influence by this. And maybe people don't talk a bit about this album now, but they're influenced by bands that were influenced by this album. Like yep. Every Time I Die and Norma Jean. Oh, and yeah. The Chariot. And which is funny because I'm pretty sure Sean did some guest vocal spots on an every time I die record. He, yeah, he yeah. did He's on a part, Norma. He did from parts unknown, which is the, uh, t- their 2013 album. And also Norma Jean as well. Like he's yep. on a Norma Jean track. I, I don't listen to that band. I, I remember kind of in high school, but yep. just doing a little research, he, he did like appear on some of those records. So that's kind of a, and there is a whole label, <laughs> uh, black market activities. That's it. Uh, the subsidiary of Metal Blade, that whole fucking label was influenced by Cole Lesk. Yep. Engineer, The Network, fucking Ed Gein, uh, Psyopus, Behold the Octopus, all of that shit came, like, all those people you know listened to this album and were like, oh shit. Guy from the Red Chord definitely knew what he was doing when mm-hmm. he yeah, did that yeah. shit. 
Um, yeah, you're right. Um, there are so many modern, there are so many bands now, like younger bands, um, that draw influence from their influences, right? So you looked at like, let's look at, let's look at Knocked Loose, right? Huge band, massive band and hardcore, arguably a metalcore band, right? They're influenced by like Disembodied, uh, I'm sure by Every Time I Die, because there's a lot of those bands that it's just kind of seen incest. And Every Time I Die is obviously influenced by like Coalesce and Botch. Uh, I mean, they came up around the same time period, uh, maybe a couple years off, uh, but like it's there. It's all there. I mean, Norma Jean, like their first record could be a Botch or a Coalesce record. Uh, you even look at like, um, oh, what's the the Christian band from Florida? The really, really big one. Um, Under Oath. Like they oh, were, yeah, yeah. there's a little bit of influence there with some of the guitar parts and like how that stuff is structured as well. And like, it's, it's remarkable to see where this band uh, kind of took things. Like this band always reminds me in vain to like 18 Visions. 18 Visions was a very big metalcore band uh, in the early 2000s, but they were doing shit that nobody had done before. And they were, they would get mad shit talked about them. And then every like metalcore and deathcore band after that was like, oh, we're going to take these parts you guys wrote and, and kind of do our own thing with it. So it's like, it's remarkable to see like when records get shit on at the time, like how influential they become later on when it's like, oh yeah, that's the blueprint. And this is definitely a blueprint to like, what became of this like more aggro slash grind, I would say grindier kind of metal core, you know, you, you name a band like Ed Gein. And like, I think that's a grind band like to me or like the abominable iron sloth, which we talked about earlier. Um, you know, another one of those black market bands that's just like, yep. If, if this uh, coalesce album hadn't happened, some of those bands would sound vastly different. And we have reached that part of the episode, the part where we suggest albums for people to listen to something that we may have been listening to a lot in our own life uh i'm gonna completely break the mold it's not anything heavy and it's not anything new but it's new to me i've been reading uh the beastie boys book and in this book they've referenced go-go music a couple times which uh i've heard of go-go because it's a uh, genre of music specific to washington dc so i've heard like Ian Mackay or some someone talk about it before, but I've never listened to it before. I listened to the album Trouble or Drop the Bomb by the band Trouble Funk. Uh, and essentially go-go music is just funk music. So if you like funk, if you like steady rhythms, wild bass lines, and uh, having fun, then listen to Drop the Bomb by Trouble Funk. I'm going to recommend a another Kansas City band. Uh, by the name of Spine. They released an album this year uh, by the name of Raices. I think that, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It, I want to say it also uh, translates to a state. Uh, this is a uh, record. I think this is their first for Convulse Records, which uh, has put out uh, a few other uh, great hardcore bands this year. I want to say Gel released an album on this label as well, but this is like 12 minutes of just pure, very angry, very aggressive power violence hardcore um uh John Hoffman who is a, definitely a friend uh you know we we can nachos used to play drums in this band so I became familiar through that but um the band's still out there doing stuff they put out this record they'll play some shows here and there i think they played flyover fest recently uh they play some local shows i saw them earlier this year in um at the albion house in chicago great great live band uh first time seeing them uh but this is a great record especially if you're trying to look for more you know Kansas City specific uh, hardcore. It, it's definitely a, a, an album I would recommend. The album I'm recommending is not a heavy record, but it does have riffs, surprisingly. Um, the Gaslight Anthem dropped a new record earlier this year, and I just finally got around listening to it. It's called History Books. It's their first record since I believe maybe 2014. Um, definitely doesn't sound like their old output, it definitely sounds more mature a little bit more moody uh, in it in sense like uh, just a good record uh, has a Springsteen guest vocal spot, which is kind of something I've wanted on one of their records for many years. And uh, to kind of tie it in with the episode, 
the record that Sean guested on for every time I die. Um, the singer of the gaslight anthem guessed it on as well. Brian Fallon guessed it on the very same record. Um, so cool little loop there. Well, that's what we've been listening to this week. We hope you enjoyed the episode. You can always recommend some things that we should check out. Maybe some things we should talk about. Maybe people we should interview. You can comment below in this episode on YouTube, Spotify, Apple podcasts. We also have a live show that airs every Monday on FM 89 vocal distortion, 6 PM central. Uh, until then, For me, Dylan, Swindler, uh, we'll be back next week. It's Riff Worship. Boo.